Hello and welcome to Side Ventures. My name is Gino and each episode I'll be talking to someone about things they do outside of their day job that brings joy and sometimes a bit of income into their lives. In this episode I'm joined by Jordan and Melissa, a husband and wife couple who have your typical day jobs but in the evenings and weekends they're the co-founders of a medieval sword fighting academy. Listen in as we discuss how they're rediscovering forgotten ancient fighting techniques and why they chose a wolf as an icon for their academy, what they spend all their earnings on and why Jordan has a particular chip on his shoulder about certain prizes that have been won at tournaments. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Jordan and Melissa from the Academy of Steel. Welcome both of you. Uh, Jordan, if you could introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and a little bit about your day job, please. Yeah, sure. I work at uh, Escape Reality, which is an escape room place in Cardiff. Um, It's part of a chain. Um, There are a few throughout the country. Uh, Ours is obviously the best. Yeah, I come from the valleys. I lived abroad for a bit, so um, moved around a little while. Uh, Lived in Kazakhstan for a bit, lived in Italy for a little bit, which is kind of where I got into what we're going to talk about later. Um, And then came back uh, to Britain. Um, Melissa and I got married and sort of settled down here. I'm Melissa. My day job is I'm a power plan and an administrator for a financial advisor. Yes, that's that's Jordan making snoring noises because it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's boring. It's it's boring <laughs> and apparently a snooze in- inducing uh, job description. But you know it, it pays the bills and it keeps my brain occupied. Um, Jordan and I spent about four years in Italy and we've um, spent the last five years in Cardiff with our school. So let's talk about the school then. So. Obviously, you've mentioned the day jobs, but we're here to talk about side hustles and side ventures. And the two of you, a husband and wife couple, run the Academy of Steel. So what is the Academy of Steel? So it's a historical European martial arts school. And historical European martial arts is it's the revival and reinvention of martial arts that existed in Europe in the medieval period. It could be earlier in some cases uh the renaissance period and then kind of into the sort of like early modern period there are certain people that kind of try and revive uh world war one and world war two uh era martial arts um but we focus primarily on the medieval because that's kind of our passion so uh for the for the most part our study is of um, a guy called fiore de liberi who was an italian uh knight and master of arms um he basically left us these four manuscripts which are to do with uh, wrestling grappling with a dagger longsword which is kind of like my love it's uh, to do with like uh, fighting an armor out of armor on horseback all of these things that a soldier in the medieval period like a professional soldier needed to know um but kind of died out around the invention of gunfire gunfire gunpowder yeah gunpowder and firearms <laughs> yeah um kind of died out around then um and whereas there's like this living lineage in the east in the west it's sort of like um it it morphed into what we th- think of as like modern olympic fencing so a lot of the time when you when you talk about fencing that's the thing that pops into your head is like two people dressed in white um kind of like going at each other with very springy foils and they're both um you know they're they're fantastic uh sports it's just that's not what i was interested in and when i found out that there was this um this kind of like movement to recreate this sort of stuff then yeah i i I just i couldn't not do it do you know what i mean so throughout history swords were the weapon of warfare and as um has technology evolved the sword evolved and changed into different shapes which we don't most people don't really recognize but you will think oh, okay so you've got these really big two-handed swords long swords most a lot of people call them claymores even though that's a very specific um sword but these big swords of knightly combat and then um evolving into these finer swords so you might see in a princess bride and side swords and things like that so it evolves through centuries of sword evolution and there's fighting styles that are specific to those swords, but they've all been lost because when gunpowder uh, and yeah. <laughs> firearms yeah. came Gunfire. in yeah. and the swords came out, went out of um, went out of fashion, there were only three types of swords that were still kind of being used mm-hmm. and those turned into the foil, epée and sabre that you have in, a, in modern Olympic fencing, which kind of, that was the sport that then 
got trained, but all the swords and sword styles from before that have gotten forgotten by history, except you had masters um, and uh, who recorded manuals, which were then kept in these rich people's archives and noblemen's collections for centuries, which due to the digital age have now become available for you know, your common person to be to have access to, to look at, to research. A lot of them have photos. Some of them are in languages that are a little bit archaic, but you can translate them. So, well, photos, I mean images, like um, yeah. illustrations. Some of them are just text. So you've got people now who are researching what it says, translating it into words. But then there's the other element of trying to figure out what they're saying into actual movement and action. So it is a dead martial art that we're trying to revive by reading the sources and then trying to figure out, okay, does they, does he mean move it this way? So move the sword to the other side. Okay, but what angle, how, and all these things that you need to try, try and work out in practice to figure out how it works. And once you figure it out, then you can pass it on and teach it. So Jordan's very good at interpreting the manuals and try and, and be like okay I think this means that and then that's what we teach to our students so it's historical European martial art is the umbrella but it's also historical fencing is another way of saying it so historical European martial arts that makes a lot of sense so it's not like is it what you'd consider sort of um, other parts of the world where you might have something like karate or judo this is specifically to Europe medieval warfare that sort of thing. And he's talking about these these books, these manuscripts and these instructions. So these are things you can actually take instruction from. They're pretty clear. There's Well, it's clear enough at least to do some interpretation. So you're not just making this up now. These are based on historical techniques. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is obviously there's always going to be um, a need to insulate certain things where there are gaps because there's Whenever anybody writes this uh, or writes these manuals, there's kind of like an assumed knowledge on the on the part of the on the part of the reader. So a lot of the time they'll just exclude things like footwork because it's like, well, if you're a knight and you've been born into like the role of a knight, then you'll know that you know you know right. all this stuff anyway. So um, there's almost like no need, and so you kind of have to reverse engineer it and go, okay, well you're standing here, you know, you're looking at body mechanics. So one of the things that I'm really interested in is is like learning how the the body moves it is a combination of like what we know like what we knew from back then what we know now um how we can kind of put that together and then turn our students into people who are quite formidable so you talked about your students and this is an academy this is what you do this is the business side of things right so you've chosen to take what you do and instruct others why have you chosen to do that you've mentioned tournaments before so i've seen your videos on your social media which everyone should check out the social media channels you've got are incredible and obviously i can see that there are tournaments that you guys go to so you could just choose to train yourselves learn from the books and go to tournaments compete yourselves why is it you choose to teach others i <sighs> I, I, I wanted to teach this because I wanted there to be a place where people like me could be, right? So I grew up doing loads of different martial arts. I boxed when I was a kid. I did sports fencing as well because it was kind of like the closest thing I could get to what I want to do now. And you've always wanted to do this sort of thing. Yeah, I, like I didn't, you know, I was that kid that picked up a stick and like used it like a sword, but I didn't, I didn't grow out of that. Do you know what I mean? Like... Um, a lot of a lot of people did, you know, they, they moved on, they picked up, you know, they, they got girlfriends and did like cool stuff and they went out and I'm still there with a stick, you know, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, this is cool. So because, you know, and I went to these different martial arts schools and they were like, tsh, like two or three ways of where it would go. There was like, you know, there were people who were like, oh, no, I'm the master. You can't question me. Right. And all this sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I like you know, they wouldn't even look me in the eye when I was paying them and all this sort of stuff. Um, and I was the nerd, you know what I mean? Like, I was, like, because um, I was scrappy when I was a kid, but I was always, like, really socially awkward as well and this kind of thing because I was into, you know, I was into, like, Star Wars and everybody else in the where I grew up in the valleys was into rugby or football, and I didn't give a shit about that. So, you know, I'd go to these places where it's like, okay, but I'm still the outsider. And then, you know, I'd go to other places where, um, the the head honcho was just kind of a bit of a bully, right? Or even like even if they had the best of intentions, they're using things like negative reinforcement. They're like, I'm gonna get the best out of you. I'm gonna get the best out of you. I'm gonna like I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna make you train under these like uh, grueling conditions and stuff like that. And I responded okay to that, but at the same time, I was still an outsider because it's like, 
you know, people think when they watch these films, like, you know, like when they have like the really stoic or kind of like standoffish master who's like, you know, you got to earn their respect and all this sort of stuff. Like, um, the thing about my students is like, I wanted a place where when they came in, I knew that what I wanted was community, the kind of community I never got that I never had access to. And it's not about like, oh, I'm going to get the best out of you. I'm like, I, I want you to get the best out of yourself kind of thing, right? So you've got these, you've got the, like, my guys, I love my guys. I have the best students in the world, right? And I'll fight anybody who argues with me on that one, right? And I'll win. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, they're, you know, they're the best students in the world. Uh, and, you know, because they've come in and they've they've given so much of themselves to each other and it's not about like oh yeah i'm going to see how much you can endure it's about like i'm going to make you pull off this technique something that you never thought you could do right and once you do that you realize like for some people it's the first time i think for, for some of them that they realize i am worthy right like uh, and that that seems like a really pompous thing right but I've got students who suffer from like uh, PTSD, some who suffer from like other health conditions or social anxiety and stuff like that. And they've they've done things that they never thought they were capable of because they've gone to these other dojos or these other training things and and they've you know, they've been the new person and and they haven't quite fit in. People fit in with us because they they give us something of themselves and we give them everything in return. And that's, that's what I wanted. Right. Um, I don't I, like, I don't care if you're the best fencer in the world. I care that you are the best fencer that you can be because that's, you know, and that's, that's the passion. Um, uh, you know, that that's what I wanted to give them. There aren't that many spaces where nerds and, you know, we are nerds, uh, where nerd, nerds, I'm not nerd. <laughs> where nerds can go and be, be, be themselves but also do something that's healthy and it engages the brain and it engages the body because it is physically active mm. but in a way that you can pace yourself i've got so many questions now based on what you just said about students tournaments competitions the reason why people do it but i want to get a bit more specific into actually the the, the sport itself right so you talked about the fact that you are using techniques that come from these manuscripts and these books you are competing with each other there's a competitive element you're sparring with each other so i'm assuming that these swords are what plastic made of foam like how do you do this safely so we don't use sharp swords um when you first come to us we will um you'll start training with a synthetic sword which is basically a plastic which has some flex um as in it bends a little bit because one of the one of the very common techniques that you have within a manuscript is pushing a thrust and if you push a thrust with something that's completely rigid it will break bones because there's nothing there to stop it so there all the weapons that we use have some flex in them so that it will flex before it goes straight through the body which is why we don't tend to use wooden swords or shin like, like they do in kendo because they have no flex in them so we'll you you'll start with a synthetic sword and then you'll move on to steel and we do encourage you to train with steel and steel these steels are they have a rebated edge so they're a couple of millimeters thick at the edge the tip is either rolled or spatulated or basically like a size of a thumb rather than a sharp point so it doesn't actually pun puncture through anything so the weapons we are using steel swords and we're using them as you would a, a steel sword but we also wear a fencing mask and padded equipment maybe with plastic armor in various places and chest protector so it almost looks like we're wearing a bomb disposal suit sometimes <laughs> uh, certain levels of protection and padding but so that we can pr do the techniques with the with a decent amount of force so that they can actually work without necessarily going at a, uh, going at each other and causing injury because we are flinging around metals uh, rods of metal which will hurt if you don't use them with control so part of what we teach is also how to do it technically correctly martially but also with control where you're not going to hurt your sparring partner but also you could if you were actually in a duel. So that's really interesting. So you're actually using metal swords and you said you, there are certain techniques that you teach to make sure that people are, say, pulling their punches, right, and not going too far. Are there any specific things that just cannot be done, any instructions that come with these manuscripts that you can't make safe in any way, that you can't even begin to teach because there's no way of, of making it safe that if the person misses the block, they're going to get tapped and be fine? 
Like I've got um, I've got a couple of swords that are that they're too heavy for me to use in sparring because the moment I make contact with somebody, they crumple like cardboard, you know. So I'm like, I just can't use this safely. Uh, because they're heavy swords they're the kind of swords that you'd like you know you'd wade into a battlefield you're like okay you know i'll take the head off this horse and then like there's a guy in armor no problem what's that no armor Ooh, bad choice you know so yeah so there's obviously techniques like that with certain weapons that there's just no way to use them safely some people try but there's we don't think that there's a safe way of doing it but then there are obvious techniques like kick their knee out and break their knee or kick him in the groin, which, you know, people tend to think is rude. So we don't... Generally, generally frowned upon. Yeah, yeah, generally frowned upon, in martial arts in general. So we don't do those techniques. We'll say that this is something that the, the, the manuscript says, at this point you would do this, but we won't actually encourage that in sparring. So in sparring, we'll do the techniques that can be done safely with the equipment that we use. And that's the kind of stuff that we'll do in sparring and to tournaments. There is because there is a tournament aspect to HEMA and tournaments tend to have a lot more restrictions on techniques that you can do because we will encourage grappling and doing the techniques which go into the grapple and then maybe takedowns to the ground. Those are techniques we will do, but the, those are restricted and they don't do them in tournaments. To, so tournaments tend to be more just straight up cut, thrust, that kind of stuff. Depending on the school and who's running the school, there are different levels of where the line is of what we will do and what we won't do. There's some people out in, where are they? I don't know, Russia, Germany. West Germany, who literally spar full on with sharp swords. And we think that is absolutely bonkers. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fair. And I mean, I think I've got a good idea now of what it would look like to, to be in your, in your academy, right? So you've got your techniques. I imagine it's something similar to what you see in, say, films and movies and TV shows, right, in terms of, like, sword fighting and medieval kind of combat. Um, you're using metal swords. You're fully padded in, padded in armor. Um, I encourage everyone to take a look at your social media channels. You're on Instagram. You're on TikTok because there's plenty of videos on there. Um, what I'm curious now is about the academy itself. So you've already talked about your students. How many classes do you have? How many people roughly in a class? Who are the kind of people that come into your classes? I'm assuming it's quite a male-dominated sport, but you know, what's the makeup of your typical group? So as far as the classes go, we run Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday. Um, so it's becoming less of a side hustle. We get like anywhere between a dozen to kind of like two dozen students uh, per class. Like sometimes it's, it's really hectic. Sometimes it's... Uh, you know, yeah, quiet is about about ten to twelve, isn't it? Um, we have beginners courses, um, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, as far as it being male dominated, we are doing our level best to try to to change that because the thing is, um, if you put if you if you put an advert up on Facebook, on Instagram, whatever, and you're like, yeah, I'll learn to use the sword, and you just put a sword there, right? You guys will just show up, right? Um, uh, for, uh, for women, for people who identify as women, uh, non-binary folks, like you really got to encourage them and say, Hey, yeah, this is for you as well. Um, and that can be, that can be a struggle. Like th this is one of the things that Melissa has worked very hard on. Yeah. So we have three chapters. We have a chapter in Cardiff Central. We have one in Caffili and we have one, um, out towards Newport and the Cardiff one, I ran a special um I ran a special event and then a beginner course that was just for women and which is what's really nice is that now not just the people that came from that course but anyone who's joined afterwards because there's there's quite a lot of women in the classes in general it's seen as a much safer space for people to come to um so it sometimes we have parity so it'll be more or less even on, on a few occasions we've had more women than men which is um, which always makes me happy. The other chapters are less diverse. <laughs> they are very male dominated. I'm usually only the, uh, myself and maybe one other. But it's something that we're trying to encourage because it, it really doesn't make, it doesn't make that much of a difference. You've got a sword. So your opponent is at the other end of a sword. And yes, they might be stronger than you, but a lot of the techniques are specifically aimed at your opponent is stronger than you and they are trying to dominate you, what do you do? And then it's kind of like the whole, what is it, jujitsu or judo, where you literally use their strength against them, use the force that they're putting on your sword against them, and 
defeat them. So there's loads of techniques there to overcome someone who's stronger and taller than you. And that's one of the great things about swords. They equalize the the strength disparity. Yeah, it sounds like the techniques and the swords then are a great equalizer. Melissa just said use the force, which backs up my argument that she's a nerd <laughs> and I'm not. I just take right? it as a reference though. Yeah, but yeah, but you said it like, you know, use the force. Anyway. I mean, have you had people turn up asking to be taught how to use lightsabers? Look, Does that happen? I have. Um I've had people ask me about really weird weapons, you know what I mean? Like I've had somebody be like, Oh, can you teach me how to use a batleth, which is like the st- from Star Trek. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, No, because it's a crap weapon. Do you know what I mean? It's like Oh, I'm gonna get all the trackies now look, emailing in. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay, I'm sorry, but it's a like you know, you can email me. Like, some people do, you know? Like, sometimes I'll make a statement about, like, this is a crap weapon, right? And I get people on Instagram going, like, you said it's a crap weapon. Like, I don't, you know, they get really angry, and I'm like, yeah, cool. Uh, you know, TLDR. Um, <laughs> you know, sorry. But what Melissa was saying about, um, uh, about kind of, like, the sword being an equalizer is absolutely true. You know, you can go to these, like, you know, you can go to Muay Thai and have massive respect for, like, the people that go to Muay Thai and Judo and Jiu-Jitsu and, you know, uh, and you know, like just general boxing and stuff and like how much conditioning that they do and all this sort of stuff. But no matter how hard you work, you cannot condition yourself against the edge of a sword, right? Yeah. There's a guy who tried, right? There's this years old video of this guy who thought he could harden his skin through breathing, breathing exercises, right? There's a video on YouTube, you can look it up, and he takes a machete and he hacks into his arm and he looks so surprised when he's just bleeding everywhere. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, <"Nah>, don't do that. <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. Well, we talked about the, the people in your academy and you've mentioned that you've got three chapters. How long have you been running? How long, when did you start doing this? Uh, about a year before COVID we opened up and, oh, so um, not that long. No, uh, we just celebrated our five year anniversary. Um, obviously we had COVID in that time. One of the main challenges was keeping our students together, keeping them sane, you know, um, and like keeping that community uh, together. We actually have four chapters if you count, because we've got two in Cardiff. So we've got Cardiff Central, we've got Cardiff East, and then the Newport one and the... And the... Yeah, yeah. Um, I was, yeah, I was just thinking about three cities, but yeah, you're right, we do have four. Um, one one thing that we're quite proud of is that during COVID, we, did, we didn't stop. So we, obviously we had to stop the, the classes in person, right. but we went online. So we had, um, we had one class a week um, online on Zoom and one sort of like fitness training. We were just doing circuits together um, as almost like a fitness club. And then one night a week, we also just watched movies together on Zoom. So we kept the community, uh, the community spirit together and people were still being connected through the academy and has some kind of like social interactions because for some people it, it is their only social circle um, not like most people have their have other social circles and it's just a aspect of the hobby but for some people they're quite insular and it, it is their only social social uh, circle so we wanted to make sure that they still had access to that even though they couldn't come to classes so yeah, we kept that going. And then as soon as they let us um, meet in groups of 15, we opened up the classes for groups of 15. When they, even before they let us go into indoors, we uh, opened up out, once it was uh, permissible to meet in outdoor spaces. We're meeting in outdoor spaces, doing classes outside and then moved in outside as it opened up. So we only really lost about half a year of in-person classes during COVID because we only stopped them when we weren't allowed to. It felt like an eternity, but it wasn't that big a chunk out of um out of our class time so we didn't we didn't shut down which is something we're, we're quite proud of since we've come out of covid we've hit the ground running because i think a lot of people became aware of hema and what we do during covid you know they were looking into it and uh and then you know we were able we've we've been expanding ever since which is nice you know that's really cool We've talked about your social media before, and on your social media accounts, obviously, I've had a look. I can see there's lots of tournaments you go to, there's lots of competitions. Um, how much of a factor is that in the training that you're doing, training for competitions? And, you know, for the competitions that you go to, you obviously go as a group, you go as a collective, but you also compete as individuals. Like, what do you win? Are there medals, trophies? Is there cash prizes? What sort of things people can win in these competitions? Well, I'm going to let Melissa take this one. 
No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. I'm gonna let Melissa take this one because, like, do uh, uh, you know what? I'll do. It. I'll do the bragging for you because that's more impressive, isn't it? It's when somebody else does all the bragging for you, right? Um, so yeah, basically, I don't train specifically for tournaments because I don't. Uh, I find that that can be quite a narrow path, right? Um, one of the things that, like I tell my students, is that you know you can you can train three things for tournaments and you can win them, right? So, like train three techniques really really well, just do that, right? And um, yeah, you can win them. And there are ways of like gaming the system that I find can sometimes detract a little bit from like what we're trying to do. I enjoy tournaments, but they're they're not the you know they're they're not the end result and i think that's one of the things that i like i try and kind of distill in the way that i teach is that you know the person who's trying to get to a destination is never going to get as far as the person who just enjoys going for a walk you know like if you if you love the process then that's the thing that will feed your love for uh for continuation and like you know and there's longevity in that um when we take part in tournaments yeah we generally melissa and i will go um, I'm finding it harder and harder to take part in tournaments because I refuse to fight against my students, right? So if my students sign up to a tournament, I will, like, step out. I'll, I'll step back from it. Um, but, yeah, they go along. They have a great time. Um, Melissa is killing it at the moment. Uh, yeah, so she, earlier this year, she took the first place in the Albion Cup Women's Longsword, which is, like, an international tournament of, like, uh, some renown. Wow. Yeah. Uh, she won a sword with a sword that she had won, right? So you can oh, win. Oh, so she won a sword as a prize in a previous tournament. Yeah. And using that sword. Won another sword. Won another sword. So yeah. you've got two swords now that you've won as yeah. tournament prizes. Yeah, two swords. Do you know how many swords I've won? How many, Jordan? None. Yeah. <laughs> Which everyone is always so fucking quick to remind me. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that this is perhaps a sore point. <laughs> it is a tad. A sword point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, right. I'll tell you this. Right. My students make fun of me for it. Right. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Great. 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 Yeah. Excellent. Anyway, um, I was walking through town the other day. I bump into Melissa's parents. Right. And uh, the first thing, her mum turns to me and just goes, "Oh, Melissa's doing really well. Well, has uh, has won a lot of medals and trophies." Where are yours? And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, cool. Anyway, so lovely to run into you. Like these uh, these conversations are a balm for the soul." <laughs> I just hope they don't hear this now. <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> just a bit of a sore point. Uh, yeah, I I enjoy tournaments, and for me, I do agree with everything that Jordan said with regard to tournaments. They do. Some people who are in it just for the the medals, they. They, they'll they might narrow what they train just so that they can like win score those points and we've always said is that if you if you fight martially you should be able to win whether it's in a tournament setting or not um so that's kind of the approach that we tend to take with our training and with our teaching as well to try and teach martial techniques that happen to also work if you want to go down tournament route i adrenaline is a drug and i really like that drug i like I like feeling the adrenaline as I'm fencing and I can't I can't trick my brain into it if there's not something on the line. So I can't trick myself into getting that rush when I'm just sparring. So I really enjoy tournaments because I enjoy the rush that I get and I feel like my fencing improves when I'm under that pressure because it's like I see the pattern. That's everything goes in slow motion. It's like, oh, this is where to do that technique that I've been that I've studied. I don't see it in sparring. There's no, there's I don't get that stimulus, and I can't trick my brain into it. So, I really enjoy the way I fence when I'm in a tournament. So that's that's why I do it. And yeah, I've 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 had a good year. And yes, I really did enjoy winning a sword with a sword that I'd previously won. That was, yeah. Usually the the prizes will be medals, probably chocolates. Um, and if you win the gold in something, it'll be um, a gift from one of the sponsors, which will either be vouchers for something to buy of your choice, or there might be a sword as a prize if you win that uh, thing. So, yeah, um, it's it's quite an honor to be able to say that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> and it's it's incredibly rewarding to watch, like when you're the person who is. Um, who's taught that person and because 
you know, we, we do train it as a martial art, which in, includes um, like certain grappling techniques. One of my all time like highlights for me this year, like there are two highlights. One was watching one of my students, Reese, practically dragging one of the other competitors out of the arena by his scalp. You know, and just like, you know, and I'm like, and I'm having to shout from the sidelines, ring outs aren't worth anything. He's like, I know, I don't care. Right. <laughs> which was great. You know, and it's like um, uh, that sort of thing. But uh, there was another one, which was um, one of my other guys, uh, Simon, who's a savage. Right. So he's like um, ex army, like real like very cool guy but a nerd right he doesn't belong to the army he belongs to us right that's the thing he's into like you know he, he does like the theory 3d printing of stuff like you know uh, like uh the, the um like the models you can get and other stuff and i met him I'm like you're ex-army and he's like you know you look at him and he's you know he's built like a brick shit house he's got this big beard you know and he's like he's got this really intense like he's lovely right but savage right and uh one of the things was like he was doing a, a workshop on like mma fighting in like a hema context at uh, one of the largest hema events in britain and uh, he partnered up with somebody and the guy kind of like leans forward like you know just sort of surreptitiously takes a glance at the logo on his on on uh, on his t-shirt and then like leans back to confirm that that is the logo that he's seen and he went ah shit because you're one of those wolf people, right? <laughs> and he was like, this isn't going to go well for me. And then Simon telling this story went, and it didn't. Right? <laughs> it like, it like, I was all over him, man. Like, I thrashed him, which was great, you know. Um, so to have that reputation uh, as, like, people who, like, if you get close to us, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to maul you. Um, that's well, ace. To explain, so the wolf is the icon of your group, right? Yes, so yeah. I've seen you're wearing a T-shirt with a wolf on it now, Melissa. <laughs> uh, and Jordan, you're wearing a wolf emblem around your neck there. Yeah. So tell us more about the logo, why you've chosen the wolf. Um, I notice as well a tattoo. Yes. With the same logo on it. Yes, so indeed. Tell us more about that then. So the um, uh, this goes back to when I was about 20. I, I started historical reenactment. Um, so I was doing kind of like early uh, medieval periods, so like Viking Age, what some people call Dark Age, reenactment. And um, we, I ended up making with my best friend Ollie this splinter group. Um, and our whole motif was like wolves. So we just had wolves on our, on our shields, um, just because I've always liked wolves. Gradually, we just started making this like little group of kind of very good friends of which Melissa was one, so she joined us. The The wolf thing kind of like then, it, it sort of stayed with us, you know. And by the time I wanted to set up my own school, so one of the things was I wanted to take that wolf that had like a lot of meaning for us and make it into uh, what was eventually kind of affectionately by the students been dubbed the Steel Wolf, right? Because it's the Academy of Steel, so it's the Steel Wolf. Uh, as a logo, it, it definitely has its like it, it's different you know it looks very different um a lot of the students now have like okay you know this is where we get into kind of like we're, we're definitely not a cult we're not a cult <laughs> territory but a lot of us have like wolf tattoos um a lot of like people have the wolf motif because it's something that they that again they like it's something that belongs to them but something that they belong to in turn um so yeah it's also I made sure of this. It looks good small. If I could give anybody any advice, right, on making a logo, um, because I went to like I went to college and I studied like graphic design and all this sort of shit. And this is the one thing that I did that's like <laughs> worth a damn, right? Is this logo? But if you ever like, if you make it small, make sure that you can still recognize it. So the wolf, you can literally like I've got a wolf pin. You've got a, you've got a signet ring. Yeah, I've got a signet ring with the design on it. I've got like the wolf pin on my jacket, which is like you can see it's like a like an inch if you can recognize it and it's just an inch like uh wide and an inch high or whatever great um i see a lot of schools i see a lot of martial arts schools i see a lot of people who make these logos and they look great when you look at them on a screen but if you look at them on a banner like a drooping banner or if you look at them like really small they don't look like anything they look like a blob so yeah that was that that would be my one bit of advice if you you know if you're making a logo Back to the wolf thing, there's also the whole concept of a pack and a community and that you are part of a pack. And 
yes, there's people are all like, oh, but there's the alpha male, but there's also the alpha female. So you you have like a partnership. And that's something that I, I kind of like associate with it is because we're a partnership and we run it together and together we run the Academy of Steel and we're we're all we all fight for each other, we all represent each other and it's it's a community thing so that it kind of all fits in very well with the whole wolf theme. Back to tournaments, my sort of the what's the there's one photo that you pin on your Facebook which is like your banner photo on your Facebook. Banner, yeah. yeah. Um it's a photo that someone took um, when I was participating in a tournament that happened to be in Cardiff that a lot of our students were taking part in. But I was competing and I was competing in one of in the finals and someone took the photo and I'm standing in my corner. Jordan's standing beside me. I'm just waiting for them to, to call um, to fight. And you've got the entirety of all, of, like uh, maybe 15, 20 students just sort of like fanned round next to that corner just like supporting me and so that's my banner photo but I was actually speaking to my opponent recently this is because that was about taken about a year and a half ago I was speaking to her recently and she said yes that was so intimidating just standing yeah, there imagine. opposite you seeing you there with your entire school behind you it was incredibly intimidating so that was quite nice did you win a sword no. No, you didn't want to say, I don't always win a sword then, do you? <laughs> nope, not always. We've talked a lot now about the sports, the training, your academy, your students. But this podcast is about side hustles and side ventures. Let's talk a bit more about the business side of things. So, Melissa, obviously you've got a day job, which is all to do with accounting and finance. I imagine you've got a good handle on this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but when it comes to the lessons i'm assuming you charge the students per lesson you've got costs involved in terms of i'm guessing equipment hall hire what does that look like how does the business side of things look for you guys okay i'm gonna hand you over to melissa because i do the i do the lesson planning side of things right melissa and ben do the boring nerd stuff right so i'm gonna i'm gonna hand you over well, i'm gonna i'm gonna zone out for like the next 20 minutes <laughs> He jokes. <laughs> he jokes, but he also does most of the social media stuff as well. Um, but yeah, so we do charge. We charge per month subscription rather than per class because that's just too difficult to track who's come to what class and who's paid for what class. So you pay a monthly membership um, and obviously insurance. But the the money that we get in, it goes towards paying for the hall and for any kind of like expenses that we have. But also it kind of it it funds our addiction to swords because <laughs> yeah we, we like having swords we've got a lot of swords we like new swords because you know you have it's to have so swords exciting. it's so exciting to get a when new the sword the postman knocks on the door right and you open the door and he looks at you and he's got a long sword in the package and he's like is that a is that a like a pogo stick and you're like uh yeah yeah cool and you take it off him right and you unwrap it and you're like oh, it's a new sword it there's nothing better than a new sword day it's like christmas <laughs> Yeah, and they, they they can they can be expensive. So yeah, it, it kind of it fuels our addiction to swords. It funds it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm not sure how this question is going to go down. How many swords can you possibly own? I know there's a handful of varieties, but like, what's the difference between one sword and another? So there are obviously there's a handful of varieties, but within those varieties, there are going to be differences. So there's differences in that it they'll weigh different. There'll be a difference in weight. There'll be a difference in length. There'll be a difference in how much flex they are, how much mass they have, how strong they are in the bind, which is a really something that you don't quite understand until you start using them. It's about how much pressure and force that you can feel in the bind when the swords cross. Um, believe me, that it's, it's a thing and different swords behave differently. And that's something that you your style of fencing will depend on the sword that you're using, whether or not you might be stronger in the bind or weaker in the bind, whether or not you'll thrust more or block more or strike more. That all depends on the specific sword that you're using. And even if we're doing the same style of fencing, so say, for example, we're doing fencing with a long sword, I will fight differently depending on the sword that I'm using. So having a variety of swords helps you to use a variety of styles. And then we also train with different types of swords as well. So there'll be long swords, rapiers, side swords, arming swords, sabers, messes, messes daggers. daggers. Yeah, all of these different types of weapons that we'll use. And the same kind of variety applies to all of them. So we do not have enough 
and I don't think we ever will. <laughs> oh, also, sometimes they break. Yeah, that's yeah. tragic. Yeah, that's tragic. When you get an idiot run onto the point of your sword and like bends the sword, and you're like, why? Why did you do that? <laughs> right. Jordan, the moment Melissa said, sometimes they break, I could see the heartbreak in your face. <laughs> yeah. Your face just dropped. Okay, so asking how many swords you could possibly have, clearly that has been well answered. Yeah. So it sounds like then taking out the running costs of what you're doing as a business, you're spending the majority of your profit on buying more swords. I want armor. Yeah. I, I want a suit of armor. We live in a cottage, so Melissa's a little bit worried about space because already, like, I have to find inventive places of where to put the swords because we put them all over the walls right some of it just in, some are just in a stack at this point <laughs> right against the wall in my office right um but yeah like i want a suit of armor and this has been an argument that we've been having for about two years now i'm just like oh you know we got an attic right <laughs> we got an attic that's fine right but apparently apparently i'm like yeah but you can but here's the thing right when you run a fencing school you can literally write them off on your taxes. So it'd be irresponsible <laughs> for us. It would be wasteful for us not to buy a suit of armor at this point, is my argument. There's you and there's museums, right? They can write off a suit of armor as, a, as a, an expense. <laughs> right. So, I mean, okay, so you're spending most of the money, by the sounds of it, on buying swords, potentially armor. You could save a fortune, Jordan, if, if you won some more swords instead of paying for them. Oh, great. <laughs> I thought uh, this was a safe space. <laughs> Uh, but what does that mean in terms of the future of the academy? You know, is this something you want to do potentially full time as a business? Do you ever want to sort of are you planning to leave your jobs to be able to do this full time? Do you factor that in or is it the moment you're enjoying what you're doing? You're loving the fact you're doing this in evenings and weekends. You go to tournaments. You've got your community, which is clearly very important to you. And you're happy to spend the profits that you're earning on swords, which I'm guessing allows you to also train those swords with your students as well, right? It's not just for you to keep yourself. Those yeah. are parts of what you do in the academy. What is the long-term plan then? How does that factor into your, your decisions? So we, it, the, the plan is that it will eventually become Jordan's full-time job. We're kind of using the, the, the profits at the moment to, to fund the purchase of swords so that we have a collection. And eventually we will slow down on that because then we will have the basics of what we need and it's just purchasing replacements. Um, and that, or at least that's what I think. <laughs> there'll still be a steady stream. Um, but the goal is that eventually there will be enough coming in for Jordan to be able to, um, to, to do it full-time. I'll probably still be working a day job um, anyway, just because it's good to have a a reliable source of income that you don't have to think about taxes on. You just mm -hmm. know it's going to come into your bank account regardless, that it's just there. So, yeah, I, I feel like that's a like stressless income, oddly, my day job. But uh, yeah. but eventually, Jordan will probably be um, come on to it full time. But we're not quite there yet, but we will be soon. We just need to figure out some ways that we can get a bit earn a bit more money doing other things so one of the things that we do we do but we haven't done enough of yet is do bachelor parties or oh, wow. um, you know, bachelor parties birthday parties or even just uh, team building corporate events so you want to have a team building event check us out um so we do like a couple of hour session where we'll teach you how all how to use a sword teach you a few techniques and then yeah so then you it's basically learn something new and do something new yeah so if anyone's interested and you want to try it out or if you want to have a gift for someone as an experience get in contact with us because we do private sessions as well so yep yeah, either group or individual we'll do those this perfectly brings me on to my final question how can people find out more about what you're doing get in contact i'll put all the links in the show notes but where can people find you online so to find out about what we do um instagram facebook uh, tiktok and youtube are probably the best places to go instagram has the most because that's the one we uh we put the most on um but also we've got a website and you can contact us through the website so get in touch with us by email or through messenger through anyone any of those sources and we'll be able to answer stuff for you we run regular beginner classes for those who are interested in attending our card of classes and but if you want to attend our class in Philly or in marshville just get in touch and we'll um we'll let you know when to come along to join those classes Brilliant. one bonus question for you jordan that i didn't ask earlier what have you got against milk cartons <laughs> I just, you know, uh, 
milk cartons killed my father. <laughs> um, and I'm just I'm trying to find the one milk carton that that killed my father, like one carton at a time. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, they're just great for test cutting. They're, like you know, you get a lot of like you you cut through it. And you're like, oh okay, yeah, cool, that was good. Just for a bit of context, we have some sharp swords that Jordan uses to cut bottles with because to understand the mechan- the bottom mechanics of how to do a cut properly and what makes a good cut, it's good to be able to actually practice cutting. So we do have some sharp swords, which is another variety of sword. Yes. And the reason, <laughs> another type of sword. So we have a few sharp swords that we, um, specifically Jordan more than me because I don't have time, practice cutting and we cut Amazing. milk bottles. Uh, also, if you don't want to come to class, if you're like, you know what, uh, and not for me, right? But you do want to learn historical European martial arts. I do have a book coming out next year. Um, Dude. yeah. So that's, that's coming out early 2024, hopefully. Uh, if not late 2024, you know, we're ready for Christmas, <laughs> right? Ready for Christmas. That's, um, uh, but yeah. Uh, and that'll be like, kind of like from basics to more advanced stuff. So, you know, you got, you got that as well. And that's another that's another side hustle. Yeah. Huzzah. <laughs> Maybe we'll bring you back on for a reflection episode when that book comes yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. Jordan and Melissa, thank you so much for joining me today. It was wonderful to hear all about the Academy of Steel. We'll put the links to everything in the show notes. So if anybody wants to find out more, they can find you. Watch your videos on Instagram, see exactly what we're talking about today and see all the different sorts that you've got and that you've won. <laughs> Melissa? Yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to speaking to you again, hopefully in the future. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, man. It's been great. Thank you both.